Okay, third time is the charm. <laughs> Michelle, you're my you're my uh my go to right now. Um, can you hear me, Michelle? <laughs> I I know what I did. I you know I'm out of practice, man. When I'm not doing lives, it's easy because I can upload it later. Um, so this Facebook Live thing, oh technology. That kind of shows my age a little bit, doesn't it? When I say, oh, there's kids and technology. <laughs> They're so good at it. Oh, my goodness. I know, Michelle. Thank you. I figured it out. I It was me. It was completely me. <laughs> so what I have said twice before right now <laughs> is that I um I have this podcast, which we are now in episode 127, and I have recently been doing a lot of really cool interviews and the people I've been able to interview have been amazing and if you haven't listened go back to circle up and get real and listen to some of those interviews because oh I, I just learned so much before I was doing all of those interviews I took a kind of a break um, from interviewing people because I had a job and when I had a job I would do my own Facebook lives like this so I would just talk about things I'd been thinking about and since I left my W-2, I've had more time. And that's why I've been able to build up that amazing um, bank of cool interviews. Today, I don't have an interview, so I am going back to just talking about what I've been thinking about over the weekend. And this will be episode number 127 in my podcast, um, Circle Up and Get Real. And so I'm looking over here because I have notes written down today. Uh, I want to remember to tell you a couple of things that I've been thinking about. So thank you if you are here live, Michelle, and anybody else who might be live. Please feel free to put comments or questions in the chat, and I will address that as we go. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of explain that in the podcast as I do the recording as well. So what happens is I have the video, and then I take the audio part out, and that's what becomes the podcast episode. So with all of that backstory, um, this is the third time I've tried it this morning. Um, I, for I know, long story, but I didn't have sound the first two times. That would be really bad on a podcast. <laughs> so we figured that piece out. I'm glad I figured that piece out. Thank you for your help, Teresa and Michelle, who were here to tell me that they couldn't hear me. With all of that said, I'm going to do a countdown and then I will jump into the content for today. So again, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to add and you're listening live, please put them here. If you're listening later on Facebook and you you want to contribute, please feel free to do that too. Just put replay in the beginning of your comments so that I'll know that you are watching the replay. Okay, so this, this shirt always does this. I don't know why. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Three, two, one. Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode number 127 of Circle Up and Get Real, where we talk about things that matter with people who matter. And today I'm going live on Facebook, which is where I have been recording some of my thoughts before I had all these great interviews that if you've had a chance to listen to them, I hope you will agree they've been really informational and inspirational the past few weeks. So today I don't have a guest, so I am just going to share with you some of the things I've been thinking about for the past couple of weeks. Actually, this weekend a lot of uh, random thoughts kind of came together. I had some huge ahas, which I love having, and over the weekend I usually have that, especially in the summer when I have some time to just be outside and allow thoughts to kind of germinate. And that's why I love Monday mornings and I love doing this recording on Monday mornings because I can share with you some of my thoughts that used to be kind of random but have sort of come together. And one of those today is this whole concept of the diffusion of innovations theory. And if you are a fan of Simon Sinek's like I am, back in, I think it was 2009, he did a TED talk. And he, that's where I first heard about this diffusion of innovations theory. And that was about um, Find Your Why in the Golden Circle, if you remember that TED Talk. I've been kind of fascinated with this concept of innovation theory. So I looked it up this morning, and it actually comes from a guy named Everett Rogers. He developed this theory, and it, he 
as I looked into who he is, he's a professor or was a professor. He died in 2004, but he was a professor of communication and journalism at the University of New Mexico at the end of his teaching career. He is from Iowa. He's from Carroll, Iowa. And that means something to me because I'm from North Dakota, which is very close to Iowa. And I used to go to basketball camp when I was in high school in Iowa. Of course, I know people in Iowa. It, it brings Everett Rogers' work closer to me somehow because I know he's from Iowa. But he, um, he was born on a farm and he didn't expect to go to college, according to his Wikipedia bio, until a teacher took him to Ames to visit Iowa State University. And that's when he discover, discovered and um, developed his interest in his field of study. So he has his BS, his bachelor's degree in agriculture, which makes sense growing up on a farm. But then he has a master's and a PhD in rural sociology. That whole concept of rural sociology is very interesting to me because my friend Rebecca Undum is starting uh, an organization called Growing Small Towns. And she does a lot with this whole concept of how it is to be in rural communities. And I love that whole concept. So I was really interested to hear that about him. And this theory that he created uh, is the diffusion of innovations theory. So if you imagine, since we're doing this on a podcast and you don't have video here, imagine a curve, just a curve that starts on the left, goes up in the middle, and then comes down on the right. And that is the basis for this diffusion of innovations theory. And if you consider that the first left hand, first two and a half percent of that curve, so if the whole curve is 100%, the little slice on the left side is two and a half. The next slice on the left side is 13 and a half. The next slice that hits up to the middle, which would be 50%, is 34%. So if you go 2.5%, 13.5%, 34%, that equals 50%. Okay, then the line right down the middle would be on the right side, 34% and 16%. That equals 50 as well. So now you've got your curve set in your mind. So the first 2.5% of that curve are the innovators, the people who come up with new ideas. The next 13.5% are the early adopters, and that's the term that Everett Rogers coined or came up with. He created this term called early adopters, and that's where he spent a lot of his time studying. The next 34% are the early majority. The, then, then you get to 50% of the curve. The right side, the next 34%, are the late majority, and the last 16% are the laggards. And if you go back to how Simon Sinek talked about this, he compared this um, or, or set this curve up as it related to an iPhone. And he said the two and a half percent are the Steve Jobs who invent the iPhone. The next 13 and a half percent, the early adopters, are those who stand in line the first for the first edition or the next new edition of the iPhone because they want to be first. The next 34 percent will buy it the next week off the shelf, they're not as excited maybe as the early adopters, but they are on board. And then you hit that half, that 50% mark, and you go to the other side where the late majority, according to Simon Sinek, um, are the people who reluctantly get a phone or maybe switch from their flip phone. <laughs> and the 16% laggards, the only reason they don't have a rotary phone is because they don't make them anymore. And those people are the ones who drag their feet for the new innovations. So as I'm thinking about this, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, it turns out I know I'm an EA. I know I'm an early adopter. And as an early adopter, there often aren't a lot of people in that 13.5%. And think about the population of your town or your, your community or your workplace even. 2.5% of any population is not very many people. That's the innovators. I don't always see myself as an innovator, but I very much see myself as an early adopter. And that can be a little bit lonely. And what I'm learning about this um, whole concept of early adopters, when it, when it goes back to Everett Rogers' work, he says the early adopters are customers, in, in the case of the iPhone, for example, who in addition to using the vendor's product or technology, also provide considerable and candid feedback 
to help the vendor refine its future product releases. And that relationship is synergistic between the provider and the customer. And um, the customer, while serving it kind of as a guinea pig in some ways, also receives information first and is also given preferential pricing, attention, and trust. This is also called being a lighthouse customer. And so as I'm thinking about this whole concept that is already created called early adopters, and I look back on my life, I look back on everything that's made me who I am, my awareness is that I always thought I was behind. I always thought I was behind when really maybe I was ahead. And what I notice looking backward is that I was a competitor. I was a competitive basketball player, I guess, because I didn't know what else to be. I didn't know what else to do with this energy I had, with this need to connect maybe with people who shared some of the same questions I shared, um, were as curious as I was. All of those things from you know learning to read at age three to not really having peers in that space, um, being more connected with people who were older, like all my life I kind of felt that way because I wanted to learn and grow. And that ended up sort of being competitive because I didn't really know what else to do. So I wanted to be best and I wanted to be first. And I, I just, you know, again, this is all in hindsight, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel like I belonged with my peers, so I looked to be the best so that I wouldn't have to maybe worry so much about having to channel, um, no, not channel, to uh, dispel some of this energy in a way. Um, there was always more that I could offer and contribute, but not a lot of people who wanted what I had. And so it was so interesting to look back after even after this weekend and think it, it can feel really lonely to be an early adopter unless you find your early adopter tribe and if you find that early adopter tribe it doesn't have to be in a, an area of you know one specific area of learning it doesn't have to be that it can be people who see the world in the way you do so that as a peer circle you can support each other in the doing of whatever it is you do because you're focusing on your being. So it's occurring to me that we need to do something. I mean, we need to take action because if you have an insight or an aha, but it doesn't lead to action, then really nothing shifts. Nothing changes in your community, in your family, if you keep all of your awareness to yourself. And that's what I've done over the course of my life because I didn't really know where to put it. I didn't have a tribe. Uh, and I, I think in my awareness of things now, when I've been frustrated or upset or, uh, you know, pick a word, um, a feeling, it's probably because I have energy that I don't know how to dispel. I don't know what to do with. And being an early adopter and trying to be in a world of you know, think about that other 50% of the world, which is the late majority and the laggards. If you live in a space where that just happens to be the energy of the space you're in, I'm, I'm not making a judgment, I'm just making an observation. Wouldn't it make sense that in order to fit in or to belong, you would do everything you could to shave off the corners? I, I just think it takes courage to admit you're an early adopter even early majority, really, because that's on the other half of the curve. 50%, half, half of any population, according to Everett Rogers' work, is late majority and laggards. So this is like making huge sense to me. This is, this is an enlightenment to me. This is um, causing me to not have to rely on my victim saboteur to keep fighting with my hyperachiever saboteur to use positive intelligence terminology because it just is it just is what it is there's really no judgment to this but what that also means is that in organizations in communities in businesses in families if we can can um, set ourselves up to honor 
all of those ways of being, those ways of seeing the world, wouldn't it be awesome to allow people to use their natural strengths and gifts in a way that contributes to the overall good without um, smashing that into a, a way of understanding because it happens to be what the majority understands? I'm not quite sure exactly what the solution is here, but I think it comes up, at least for me, in verbal processing and in collaboration, in true collaboration. When dialogue happens, and I've talked about this so many times, but dialogue is suspending previous assumptions in order to learn from each other. It's an agreement we have when we come together that we will both all, whoever's in the group, that we will all agree to suspend previous assumptions for the time we're together so that we can build on each other's ideas. And in that space, if we are truly in dialogue and truly in that space where we allow the conversation to happen instead of force it or make it, we all learn from each other. I learn from myself. That's why I like doing these Facebook Lives because whether or not there's anybody even listening, there's always the possibility. And I know that you are here now, Michelle and Rosemary. I know that there are people listening. Thank you for being present. However, if you're not present personally um, and presently, at some point there's the possibility that someone will listen to this. And that to me m makes the listening space for my speaking much more robust. And so that's why I like doing this. I like hearing what I hear what comes out of my mouth. How about that? I like being able to hear what comes out of my mouth when I get myself out of the way. And when I allow thoughts and um, inspirations to be born into a, a listening space of this podcast and uh, to maybe attract to myself the forces I wish to use and the cooperation of other people to use um, the fifth point of the self-confidence formula in Think and Grow Rich, which is really uh, something that has really impacted me. Um, when I do that, when I allow that, it seems that I'm in a vibrational energy of flow. Not trying, not forcing, not playing small, none of that. And when I go first, when I am an EA and a, and you know, just accept that that is who I am, EA, early adopter, when I accept that I'm a lighthouse, to use Everett Rogers' term, then I can invite others to do the same thing. So it's not about me being the authority or the rule maker or anything like that. It's about me going first and asking questions so that the rest of us can be in that same space so that we can all be lit by the same light that comes through all of us, not, not from us, but through us. So a victim where I've been stuck, you know, my victim saboteur, which is the saboteur in my head that um, prevents me from playing big, the victim would say, why do all of these things keep happening to me? <laughs> and it's easy to do that. Why don't people understand me? Why? You know, that's a victim mentality. And I, I've, whether I've admitted it or not, that's kind of run my thought process for many years of my life. What if instead of happening to me, and, and maybe not even happening for me, what if things happen through me? What if my being is to allow information and inspiration to come through me? for the good of whoever that 13 and a half percent is. I don't think my space is in the 34% of the early majority or the 34% of the late majority. I used to think it was, I don't think it is. I think when the EAs, when we EAs, we lighthouses can come together, we will inspire the next 34%, which is the early majority to come along. And what I remember from Simon Siddick's talk is he said, that's the chasm. When we go from the 13.5% of early adopters to the 34% of early majority, the system tips. 
And when you go back to spiritual conversations, they'll say that far it takes far fewer people vibrating on a higher energy level to lighten, enlighten the world. And so it's not that we have to wake everybody up. It's not that everybody has to do anything. Actually, nobody has to do anything. But if it occurs as something that is inside of you waiting to come out, then that's where this conversation is relevant. It may not be relevant to everybody, and that's okay. It is what it is. There doesn't have to be a judgment in that. But if this speaks to you at all, this is what our Get Real Circle is about on Facebook. It's our private Facebook page, and it's a place where we can have these kinds of conversations. What I'm noticing there, too, we have almost 1,500 people there, but very few of them are are active which might be about 13 and a half percent so people were interested in it at one point almost 1500 people but not very many of them are active it might be about 13 and a half percent when i think about it it doesn't have to be everybody if that 13 and a half percent in that private facebook page can get enough inspiration and light to be able to go back to their organizations, families, communities, and share that. Isn't that the point? So I have a course that I've created, and it will be a similar situation. It's called Real Me Intensive, and it's a six-week course, and it will be held in, in when you're if you're listening to this now, it will be held next week. But if you're listening to this later, I I'm anticipating we will be having one or two of these a year the next one will probably be in the fall and it's at getrealcircle.com so if you want more information about this go to getrealcircle.com and you can watch a one hour video presentation of me just sharing my lived experience which will attract you or not again 13 and a half percent is not that many and if we can find each other we can light up the world. I believe it to the core of my being. And if it's you, you'll know it. And if it is, reach out. Let's collaborate. And as always, let's get real. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you again.